So I'm here today with uh, Jonathan Levy, also known as our Zero Waste Guy. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so first question, what inspired you to transition to a sustainable lifestyle? Uh, I was working at a large uh, retailer re in a warehouse. It was um, almost 2 million square feet, so like 175,000 square meters, to put it in perspective for the global audience. Uh, it was massive. And my job was to supervise the me mechanics that maintained all the conveyor belts and the forklifts. And you just picture just these massive piles of uh, pallets of single-use disposable consumer goods. And I didn't really know what zero waste was, that term zero waste was at the time. This was about eight years ago now. But I knew that what I was doing, I f like optimizing the flow of stuff through this big system, I, I, I felt like I was actually helping a big retailer sell more stuff. And it really didn't align with my values. And I found myself just trying to cope by spending lots of money. I was going out to happy hour every day. I was buying things. I had a season pass to go snowboarding at Mammoth. And I had all this stuff, um, but it wasn't, it didn't feel good. And um, I realized that I had to really start being more mindful of what I was spending my money on and how I was living because uh, I grew up in Northern California near San Francisco and I felt like um, I was an environmentalist. But then all these years later, I felt like the way I was living was not aligning with my values. So I started to make more of an effort to put more focus on how I could live within my values. And I realized that just consuming just for the sake of consuming wasn't really going to work anymore. So that's when I decided to go, or I would, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know what zero waste was at the time, but that's where I started to transition to being more sustainable and more conscious of my decisions. Cool. So how do you incorporate sustainability into your everyday life? You know, like walk us through a day in your life. I, well, when it comes to like, it's a little different right now because with coronavirus, it's not as easy just to go out and about and get the things that I need and to buy package free and whatnot. But I, the first thing I did is I took an inventory, not a literal inventory, but a, a uh, you know, I just kind of looked at everything that I had and I realized that everything, I pretty much had everything that a human could possibly need to live. So I didn't need more stuff. And uh, the first decision I made was to start to use up the things that I already had. I think that there's this misconception that to, um, and this was with any lifestyle change, there's this misconception that you need to buy a bunch of stuff, you need to read a bunch of books, do all these things. And I mean, there's an unlimited amount of resources online for free that can tell you everything you need to do about being frugal, about being mindful, about being zero waste. And I just started figuring out, well, how can I use up the things that I already have? Um, how can I make more conscious decisions when I'm buying new things? And I realized that it's like, it feels impossible. It's overwhelming to figure out if something is sustainable or ethical. Um, so I do my best to buy, to start when I started buying things or when I needed to buy stuff, buy things that seem to be well-made, durable, um, I, I'd like to say I focused on buying, buying locally manufactured stuff, but it's really hard to find uh, locally manufactured things. I mean, their websites like Etsy obviously make it easier. Um, but I really just started being more mindful of like, what am I buying? What am I, what am I consuming on a regular basis? And how can I make it more, uh, a more sustainable purchase? Maybe that means less packaging or no packaging or purchasing something that I know that is exchangeable or refillable in some way and uh, trying to avoid just buying prepackaged goods because yeah. everything seems to be packaged. Yeah. yeah, and I guess in that, on that note, like what were the initial challenges or even surprises that uh, you found going, going zero waste and, and how did you overcome these? Everything that we buy comes in a package. And even if we don't see the package, it originally was transported in a package. It was wrapped in film plastic. It was put on a truck. It was, and then that film plastic was taken off and just thrown away because it's 
not always recyclable or not always a market to recycle it. And I've got to go insane, go in circles talking about that. But the biggest advantage I noticed uh, when I first transitioned to zero waste was that when you try to take the packaging out of the equation, uh, you find that you are very limited in what you can buy because so much is packaged. So I found myself gravitating towards the fresh produce. Um, I don't think I'd heard of even what kale was until like five years ago. Like I was very limited. I thought I was very open-minded to food, but I was very limited. And, and when I found myself spending more time in the, um, in the produce section, I found myself learning to, to try or just trying new vegetables, new fruits that I had never even heard of before or never even noticed and learning to really enjoy, enjoy eating different things. Um, I know it sounds kind of silly, but uh, I was a, definitely much more of like a very basic, predictable meat and potatoes kind of diet. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, what are these? Oh, these are lent like lentils. Oh, and lentils come in different colors and there's peas and there's all these things that you can buy in the bulk section. And I was like, oh, that's how I go. That's how they, you know, you get Indian food because you use this lentil and you use this type of masala and you use these seasonings. I'm like, oh, that's how this, that's, that's where this comes from. It's not, you know, it's not as uh, complex or uh, overwhelming as I originally thought. You know, when you talk about individuals going zero waste, there is, I mean, this figure was taken in 2019, but currently five trillion pieces of plastic waste in the world's oceans. How big of a difference can an individual make in comparison to the rest of the world taking action? Uh, it's a two, I always say it's like a two-pronged two approach. The first, just generally speaking, somewhere between like, I don't know, 25 or sorry, 70% or so. So maybe like somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of all waste that's generated is generated more in like a business level. It's not the consumer per se that's directly creating the waste. And that, and that could be because in the manufacturing process, there's a byproduct that gets thrown away or it could be that the restaurant is looking to make that perfect fifteen dollar uh, kale salad, so they're like, "Oh, this this one doesn't look good," so they throw it away. And there's all this waste that happens behind the scenes. So business is like the biggest offender when it comes to waste because they make the most of it. But we have individuals who every day there's seven. How many, I don't know how many billion of people there are, you know, seven, over 7 billion people or something that are, that, are, that are consuming. And some of us, specifically in the Western world, consume more than everybody, way more than our fair share. Uh, nonetheless, uh, if you're like an individual in America, in the Western world, then you are consuming more than other people are. And every choice we make is, is a decision to shift the, the future of how uh, of what's sold and how it's sold and how it's manufactured. Um, it's like a two prong, it really is that two pronged approach because I see it, um, I'm on my local environmental advisory commission. We, it's through the city government, it's a volunteer position and anytime um, we, we, there's a conversation about uh, banning a single-use plastic or removing a ban of a single-use plastic or something related to the environment, related to air, water, power, and uh, waste, they're supposed to come and talk to us about it. And then we, we make a recommendation and then city council talks about it and they take into consideration our recommendation and this is a huge thing. And we, we, it took us like a year and a half, I think, to ban styrofoam, you know, expanded polystyrene which is like the plat the foamy plastic that it has the, the industry says it's recyclable but no one's ever seen it get recycled and where I'm going with this is there was literally I live in a city with 160,000 people and there was like all these lobbyists from the manufacturers of the single-use plastic the American Chemistry Council which is a big advocate for using 
crude oil, using oil in the manufacturing process and science and all this stuff. There was like the grocery association was there because they're concerned that if styrofoam gets banned in restaurants, then it's going to get banned in their stores. And it was like there was all these multi-million, multi-billion dollar industries advocating for my little city. 150,000 is not little. In, 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 in Southern California, it's little, but I know a lot of places that's big. But in the grand scheme of things, it was just one one of 90 cities in just in the county of Los Angeles. And there was like, uh, you know, there's just a handful of them, but because they have so much money, they have professional lobbyists, professional government affairs people, professionals there trying to poke holes in the community's argument for banning styrofoam. So we not only do we need responsible business, but we need, we need, enlightened individuals who know how to advocate for environmental justice. Because if we don't have individuals advocating for it, then all the city officials, all the government, all the policy makers, the legislators are gonna have to go on is what the industry professionals tell them. And the industry professionals are always gonna tell them, it's bad for business, we don't have enough information, uh, there's no research to support this. Uh, this other plastic's not better than that plastic. So since this plastic's not any better, why ban that one? And what was crazy is like, there's even Dart, which is the largest manufacturer of single use foodware in the country, which might also make them largest in the world, I don't know. And they're just like, it doesn't, they sell it all. They sell, all, they sell extended polystyrene, regular polystyrene, polypropylene, paper fiber, paper fiber coated in plastic, they sell everything. So it's not like they're gonna lose any business because they're just gonna go from selling styrofoam to selling something else. But it was more about the fact that they're being regulated. And I know I went on a long tangent about this, but really we humans, we individuals, it's hard to see it, but the way we spend our money matters. But it's hard when you're looking at the, you're looking at trying to find, uh, I don't know, a new running shoe and you go on Amazon and the, the running shoe you're looking for has 15,000 ratings and you go to the, your local shoe store and you don't know how, you don't, you know, you know, you don't have, you don't know what the, you don't know what the quality is. You don't know what the feedback is. You're just trusting the person who's selling it to you. It's like, it's hard to compete. It's hard to compete against that. Um, but we really need to, we need to do that. We need to push back. We need to ask questions. It's like, you know, this is where that, um, where sustainability, consumerist culture, it all, it all relates to equity, it relates to class, it really, it's all interrelated. Yeah, I, I totally get that. And I guess also in response to that is the individual, you know, if no individuals did it, then nothing would change, nothing would happen. So, you know, I guess that's another, another thing to think about. Like if no one did it, yeah. then nothing would change at all. I mean, we've already kind of touched upon this, but, you know, obviously, what is your take on the consumerist culture that we live in today and how do you think we can actually start making that transition from I mean we've already talked about it, you know individuals kind of caring and actually making that difference and sharing their opinions and voicing their opinions but what do you think the key uh, things are that you know can transition to a sustainable future in the Western world, we usually, in the affluent Western world, we don't have to see the, 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 the negative repercussions of our actions because we just externalize it. We ship it, we ship it to a landfill out somewhere else. We burn it in some, somewhere else and not, not my neighborhood. We ship it overseas. I mean, we're so, we're so uh, many of us are so just like insulated from what actually happens to our, our stuff. That's why I'm always such a big advocate is consume less. I don't know if it's sustainable. I don't know if it's ethical. I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to try and think it is, but not, and, and maybe it really is, but not everyone can afford to spend, you know, whatever dollars on this product. So if you can't afford it, you got to buy something that may or may not be ethically made, then just buy something that's durable, that will last a long time that you can fix and repair and, and, and try to remove yourself from the waste system because we have all taken for granted for way too long that we toss it in a bin 
and it disappears, it goes away, and we consider it taken care of when really we have no idea what happened to it. Yeah, denial. We can we can just put it away and just ignore it and pretend that you know it's not going to go somewhere else and destroy another ecosystem or destroy another piece of land. You know, like we don't we don't have to think about that. So yeah. yeah. And just finally, what does a sustainable future look like to you? The, the, the future I envision is where sustainability is just integrated into everyday life. So it's no longer a premium product. The day that anybody has access to the same resources that I have access is the day that we will be, we will have arrived. Uh, we're not there yet. So the sustainable future is we support our local businesses we know our neighbors, we spend more time outside, we spend less time online, we spend less time on the internet, less time on social media. Everybody, everybody has an opinion about everything. Um, I share something with the best of intentions. There's always somebody who's like, well, you're privileged, you have this, you have that. No one can afford that, no one can do this. No, that. And it's like, oh my goodness, I'm trying to advocate for sustainability. I'm trying to make it as, uh, equitable and every day as possible. <laughs> so part of that vision is that we get away from the technology and into the local communities. When uh, we show up, we know our neighbors, we show up to city council meetings, we spend, we take all the time we spend on social media, watching Netflix, online shopping, and we put that back into our local communities we would see that sustainability would get much more easily integrated into society because sustainable practices make sense, but they only make sense when you interact with your local business, local businesses, you know, Amazon is not, Amazon could take back every cardboard box they ship out and use it a second time, but they don't, they don't care that Amazon's not responsible. This is like this external, ex, this idea of external externalization of waste. Most businesses, they manufacture products, they distribute the products, they sell the products, and then they wipe their hands of them, they wash their hands, they're completely done. If there was a local business that was just throwing all this trash into the environment, they would have hell to pay because everyone from the community would be outside their door saying, why are you offloading all this junk on us? When we shift to a more community-focused uh, society, a more circular, society, it will be more sustainable, it will be more equitable, because we will be supporting local businesses. Uh, we will not be opening up big Walmarts that then put all the mom and pops out of business, or open up Amazon that put up, put all kinds of other online businesses out of business. Um, that's really the key to a, a sustainable future right there, is supporting your local economy, supporting your local community. And your answers have been absolutely amazing. Uh, you're so I love I love how passionate you are, and how educated you are. I honestly, yeah, I yeah, you're inspiring. You really are. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for <laughs> thank having me. Thank you.